preparation for Brother Trace's lesson, I'll be reading from the fourth chapter of Matthew, verses 3 through 10. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him along into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you, and on their hands they will lift you up, so that you do not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put your Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him along to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I do appreciate you being here to worship with us. If you will mark your song books, and we'll get to Jeff's imitation song here in just a few moments. I do appreciate Ryan's prayer. Uh, this is uh, something that has just come up recently in uh, my current life, and um, it's an issue that I have struggled with. Um, so I'm hoping that. Uh, maybe we do have our toes stepped on a little bit, but please understand I'm not pointing my finger at anyone in our congregation other than myself. Um, so hopefully this is one of those sermons that get you to think and look at scripture um, and maybe um, put into context where I know I have previously in my life taken out of context. Um, but I have titled this particular sermon, Taking the Bait. I appreciate each and every one of you being here, as I said, and those of you that are guests, I appreciate you as well. Um, so hopefully you understand that our goal is to preach God's word according to spirit and truth um, and apply it in the means in which it is intended for us. Um, and when I look at the scriptures, I move. That won't move. we have ways of dealing with things. And I know several of us have talked about the... Um, you know, different social medias and things, but it seems like right now there's this constant battle out there in the news and on uh, different podcasts and on social media, which I anymore just try to separate myself from because there's a constant battle between people of the world and Christians. And what I need for us to understand, what I need to understand, what Christians need to understand is that the only person that's going to win in that battle is Satan himself. He has orchestrated it. He has put it together. And it's the idea of where I got this title is taking the bait because all of these hot topics that are out there that they're, you know, throwing in our face and trying to say, well, this is right and this is right. And we jump in there and we begin to judge and we begin to condemn and we come across in a way that God doesn't intend for us to come across. We've taken the bait. And what we end up doing as religious individuals is we do more harm for God. We do more harm for Jesus than we do good. And our intention should be to always do the good and be the good. When we look at what the scripture says, it does specifically tell us as Christians that we are of this world, but we are not to be, or we are not to be of the world, but we are just to be in the world, right? It's this life that we live day in and day out, serving Jesus, walking the walk as a Christian, doing our best to do what is right and treat others with love and kindness that keeps us on the path we need to go. We can't just become Christians, get baptized, have our sins forgiven, just say, okay, I'm just going to be accepted from this point forward. It's not the way it works. But we're baptized for the forgiveness of our sins because Jesus was put on that cross. His blood poured from his body to wash our sins away. And when we're put down into the water, those sins are washed away and we come up anew. And I say it every time I'm up here. From that moment forward, you're going to mess up. It's going to happen. We do because we're human beings. 
When we look at what the scripture tells us in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Then he says, do not be conformed to this world. Right? You're in it. This is where you're going to live. This is where you're going to serve. But you can't be part of it. It says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. When I look at God's scripture, that's what it's all about. What is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. It's his guidelines to show us, this is how I want you to live. If you live on the left, if you're part of the world, you're not going to be accepted in the end times when judgment happens. You live on the right. He'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. In John 15, Jesus is talking to the people and he says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before I hated you. Right? Talking to the disciples, talking to Christians, saying, they're going to hate you. They hated me. A perfect being who showed nothing but love and compassion and proved that he was the son of God, and they hated him so much they killed him. He says, you need to expect it. He says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. So if we are living our life according to the scriptures and we're applying his love, his forgiveness, and we are walking to be the light of the world as Christians, then the world's going to say, yeah, you're crazy. You're old fashioned. They'll make fun of you. How can you believe in such an archaic book? It's just a fairy tale. A and they'll constantly dig at you. But Jesus says, expect it. It's going to happen. They're not going to hate you any more than they hated him. And we know that we were saved because they hated him. One of the things we have to always keep in mind is that one of our jobs as Christians is to pursue peace. We have to strive for peace. In Hebrews 12, verses 14 and 15, he begins with, Pursue peace with all people, then the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Right? If we don't have peace, if we don't have holiness, how is anyone going to be brought to God? He says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Meaning that we ourselves cause sin when we're not pursuing peace. When we get into these debates, when we get into these arguments, when we confront people from our computers and we start telling them hurtful and angry and hateful things. And once again, I'm talking to myself, please understand. I've done it. I've repented, and I've done my best not to do it again. Right? But I've been caught in that trap, and I took the bait. And that's exactly what's happened, is that hook is constantly being thrown out there. If you think about what the Scripture reading said, Satan quoted Scripture to Jesus. And Jesus replied, but it also says this. The world will use Scripture against us. But we have to use it rightly and justly. We simply have to stop taking the bait and getting pulled in. When we talk about the context of God's word, in 1 Timothy 5.20, it is one of those scriptures that, um, you know, I've heard the term probably most of my life of cherry-picking scriptures. And a lot of people of the world, even religious people, even people and members of the Church of Christ do it. They pick out the scripture and they apply it to every scenario. Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. And they apply that to everyone. But if I just take it out of context, then that means everyone in this world I can't associate with that's not a Christian and in the body of Christ. When I look at what it actually says, and I begin back in its context in verse 17, it says, The elders who lead well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scriptures say, you shall not muzzle the ox while it is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not accept accusations 
or an accusation, excuse me, against an elder, elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. So he's saying that scripture, the next verse, is talking about an elder who is living wrong and leading the church wrong. It's not talking about everyone in the world. So if we're going to be looking at the scriptures, we have to apply it in the way it means. And once again, as a Christian, I've done this. I have cherry-picked scriptures and just applied it instead of looking at the entire context of what the apostles and the writers were talking about. We have to stop taking that bait and just saying, well, you know, this is what the Bible says. Because that's exactly what Satan did. Well, the Bible says this. This is what God said. But Jesus knew better. He knew what the truth was. And that's what we have to be seeking out. When it comes to issues in the church, and once again, please understand, there's going to be issues in the church. There's going to be issues in every congregation. There's going to be issues here at Gadsden. In Matthew 18, Jesus outlines what we need to do. He says in verse 15, he says, Now, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that on the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen, even to the church, he is to be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Then you are to not have them a part of your congregation. But there's three steps that need to take place. When we have a brother or a sister worshiping with us and they're not living right, our first step is to go to them in private. To be secret about not to say, hey, we all need to go to their house and confront them. Right? And then if they don't want to listen, then we grab a couple more. And if they don't want to listen, then we present it to the congregation. And then if they don't want to listen, then we say, okay, we need to address this major issue. But what people end up doing anymore, it seems like, is they just want to send all of these emails without ever going to the brother or sister, without ever talking to them, without ever having a conversation and they start making these accusations or they send a letter. <laughs> this is what you've done and this is where you're going. That's not what the scripture says. Is it commonplace? Yeah. Brother Allen was preaching for us last Sunday morning and he talked about we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And for me, a confrontation where I need to go talk to a brother or sister that is doing wrong, that's very uncomfortable. I don't like confrontation at all. But if that's the way I'm supposed to handle a situation, that's the way I got to do it. We got to stop taking the bait like the rest of the world. We sit behind our computers or we sit behind a paper and pencil and, and we try to handle it that way. We have to be able to talk to one another. And that's something that we need to improve on as Christians and apply to our lives. One of the key scriptures I want to look at, though, is a message that Paul gives. I came upon this about two years ago, and it was an eye-opener. And as I said, recent things that have happened in our lives, I felt like it, this is something that we need to truly study and look at what Paul is saying. So if you'd like, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 9, it says, I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. He's saying, that, I, yeah, that, that was my instruction to you as a congregation. That was my instruction to you as the church. Don't associate with, ate with those people. But then he says in verse 10, I did not at all mean with the sexually immoral people of the world. He said, or the greedy and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to leave the world. He's saying that my information on how you need to live and who you need to dissociate from your congregation, from the church, are the individuals who are aware that they're living in sin and don't want to change it. But when it comes to the world, that's not what I was talking about. Those are Paul's words. And he, he gives us that recognition that if we cannot associate with sinners of the world, where are you going to be? Because I don't know of any bedrooms in this meeting house that we stay in. 
because then we would have to be here and only here and only be with each other. And we don't do that. We live in the world. He's not telling us we have to get out of the world. He says, but actually, in verse 11, he said, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. That was his context. He's saying these so-called brethren, male or female, are proclaiming to be Christians, but living in sin, and they don't want to get rid of their sin. Those are the people I'm talking about. If he is a sexually immoral person, or a greedy person, or an idolater, or a verbally abusive, or habitually drunk, or a swindler, not even to eat with such, that, such a person. Then he goes back to the idea of the world. For what business is of mine is it to judge outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? Right? We can judge, according to God's scripture, the right way to live. And if we as Christians are aware of a brother or sister that is not living that way, then that's who we are to address. He says, but those in verse 13 are outside, God judges them. Then he goes back to, this is what I meant. Remove the evil person from among yourselves. They should not be in your church. They should not be in your congregation. They should not be a part of you because they are aware they're living in sin. You have confronted them and they refuse to change. Then you can disfellowship them. But we get into this trap, once again, pointing at myself, where I know what the scripture is, and I know what sin is, and I begin to judge the world and condemn the world. And that is not what we're supposed to do. I've had individuals tell me that family members who are homosexual, I should never speak to again disagree with that. Do I agree with them? Not at all. Am I ashamed of them? Yes. Do I love them? Absolutely. They're my family. But I can't just say that I'll never speak to them again. If I fall into the trap of never speaking to them again, how am I showing the love of Christ? How am I showing the mercy of God? How am I showing the forgiveness that I was given? I will continue on with that idea. Look at what Jesus said. In Matthew 9, Jesus is, you know, being spoken about. It says, And the Pharisees saw that they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax collector and sinners? Right? We're, we're not to be associated with anyone in the world. We should never be around them. We should cast them out and treat them as if they don't even ever exist. So when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Now go and learn what this means, folks. And he's telling them about the Old Testament. He says, I desire compassion rather than sacrifice. Right? Going back to what God said all the way back to the beginning when the children of Israel could not seem to understand that his laws were about the love, the compassion, the desire to serve God. He said, I don't want your sacrifices because they mean nothing to you. I want your compassion. I want your heart. And Jesus is saying that it still applies today, and you're still not getting it. Pharisees, you, you know the scriptures and you know what they mean, but you're still not applying them. Right? He says, for I did not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call the sinners. We have many examples. I'll go through four real quick. But in John 8, we know the, the story of the adulterous woman and how all of these wise men had gathered together from old to young. of the And they knew the scriptures. And the scriptures said that if somebody is caught in adultery, they are to be taken out of the city and stoned to death because it's a sin. And they wanted Jesus to condemn this woman. And he didn't. Could he have? Yeah. But Jesus knew what the, what the scriptures were saying. Number one, they were supposed to bring both, both of them. Where was the guy in this scenario? They kept him out of the scenario. They just wanted the woman put to death. Were they sinners? Absolutely. All right? And he tells them, hey, if you have not sinned, you go ahead and cast that first stone. And then he continued to write in the dirt until they all left. But then he looked at her, knowing that she was a sinner. 
forgives her of her sins and tells her to go and sin no more. She was a woman of the world, and yet he still showed her love and compassion. When we look at Saul, right, we even talked about Saul this morning uh, when Brother Gene was leading the class. Saul was an individual putting Christians in prison, standing back and watching them being killed, and you know he was persecuting all of them because he didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ, was the Messiah. But Jesus gave him a second chance. I mean, Saul was a sinner, let's face it. And he confronted and said, hey, you're wrong. I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. You can choose to follow me if you wish, but you better serve me. And we know that he did. But Saul was a man of the world. And we have Zacchaeus, the tax collector, right? He, tiny guy, climbs in a tree, wants to see Jesus. And when Jesus says, I'm going to your house, the people mock him. What are you doing? He's a sinner. He's a tax collector. He's an evil person of the world. And he repents of what he's done. And Jesus says, salvation's come to your house today. And look at the people who wanted Jesus to die on a cross. They were people of the world. They didn't want Jesus to be the Messiah. They didn't want him to be the Christ. They didn't want him to be their Savior. And before he died, Jesus asked that God forgive every one of them. Because they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. He could have condemned every one of them. Because they were all assistant to murder. But he didn't do it. When we look at 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 9, it says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor rivalers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Well, there you go, Brother Barker. You just said it. All those people in the world are going to be condemned. Absolutely. But when we put it into context, we have to see what he then says. In verse 11, he says, Such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. Some of them were sinners. Absolutely. Absolutely. But how did they become Christians? If they are living as a homosexual, if they are living as an adulterer, if they, if they are living as an idolater, if they are a thief, a swindler, or whatever, they're living in sin, how in the world did they hear about Jesus? How did they find out about his love and his compassion? How did they find out about the mercy of God if all we did was ignore them and pretend they don't exist? How did they become Christians? Someone had to show them. Someone had to teach them. Yes, they were once of the world. And if we apply what Paul has said, if they become Christians and they're forgiven and they are sanctified by the blood of Christ, but they still choose to go back to the world in sin, which we can see in the New Testament many Christians did, then we confront them. And then we bring a couple others and confront them. And then we confront them in front of the church. And if they still don't want to change then we disfellowship them. But if all we do is ignore the world, we can't teach them Jesus. We can't shut the world out. I know some people are retired and it's easier to stay at home, right? The majority of us, I think, are in colleges or in schools or uh, you know, in jobs where we're part of the world. And if we ignore every single person that is not a Christian, how can we save a single soul? We have to apply God's word the way it is intended. And we have to stop taking the bait and judging people of the world because that's not our job. If we continue to take the bait, then we're going to have a problem. But the title goes along in twofold. Because there's taking the bait and then there's taking the bait. And the bait is this book right here. God's word. If I take the bait with me, then I've got every tool that I ever need. In Romans 10, 14, it says, How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him who they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? If we cast out every sinner of this world and we don't associate with them, how will they ever know the love of Christ? How will they ever know 
that he was born, that he lived a perfect life, that he was willing to be sacrificed on a cross for them, that he died. He stopped breathing. He began to decay. And in the grave, he arose again in three days, and we have forgiveness of sins because of it. That's debate. That's what we have to share with the world. Are they all going to listen to you? No way. Of course they're not. Did they all listen to Jesus? No way. Of course they didn't. Jesus tells us that when it comes to sin, it's going to happen in his church. Because once again, we're all human. Baptized, we're still Christians, but we're still human. And we make mistakes. And if we use the bait, if we use God's word, then we can correct it. Jesus tells us in Luke 17, he says, Now he said to his disciples, It is inevitable the stumbling blocks come. You're not going to prevent it. Right? Look at the disciples. They made mistakes too. Right? It couldn't be stopped because they're humans. It's the repenting that gets it corrected. Jesus does say, but woe to the one through whom they come. It is better for him if a millstone is hung around his neck and he is thrown in the sea than that, than that he may cause one of these little ones to sin. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Well, how many times? Right? It says in verse 4, And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Now, if you're like me, now understand I don't play baseball, never really played baseball. But even in my classroom, my students, you get three strikes. Right? First time, I'm going to talk to you. Second time, you're going to lose your recess. I'm going to warn you. Then on the third time, I'm calling your parents. And I do that. Right? But then after that, we've got a new day, and we continue on. But if that's the way we apply it to our lives as a Christian, we're missing the boat. We've taken the bait of the world. Well, I, they've wronged me too many times. I'm never going to forgive them. Ooh, wow. What does Jesus tell us? If we want to be forgiven, we must forgive. Because if we aren't going to forgive, Jesus is going to say, sorry, I can't forgive you. We don't want that. How many times have you sinned? Since you were baptized, how many times have you sinned? If you're like me, more than you could ever count. But we want Jesus to forgive us every single time. Somebody's wronged us seven times in a day, but they tell us that they're sorry, they're asking for forgiveness. We better forgive them. It's our job as a Christian to stop taking the bait and use the bait that we are provided. When we talk about the sinners among the world we, or among the church, then we need to understand that those individuals can still be saved. Right? I, I recount times that Christians have come forward and said, you know what, I messed up. You know, I, I need the church to know and I ask for your forgiveness. I've done it. Right? And James 5, starting in verse 19, says, My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you, once again, He's not talking to people of the world. He's talking to the congregation. He's talking to the Lord's church. If anyone among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that the one who has turned a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. That's a glorious thing. It's not easy to repent. It's not easy to recognize and admit that you're wrong. My wife can tell you I really struggle with that second one. But if we do that, our soul can be saved. And the one that led us there has helped save our souls. When we take the bait, we have to understand that Jesus is very specific about the things that we use. Paul is very specific about the things that we use. Most of the gospel mentions one, if not all of these. Right? We have kindness, we have patience, and we have gentleness all surrounding the teaching that we're doing. Now, I'm not teaching science to you. I'm not going to teach you math. I'm teaching God's word. I'm teaching his love, and I'm teaching his salvation. 
When Paul writes to in 2 Timothy, he puts it all together in a couple of scriptures. He begins in verse 24. He says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but you must be kind to all. You must be skillful in your teaching, meaning that you know what you're teaching. You know God's word. You need to be patient when you're wrong, because let's face it, if you've ever worked on converting someone to Christianity, sometimes it's a fight. Sometimes they get mad at you. Sometimes they don't want to admit that they're wrong. But that's okay, because if we're patient, then we can continue on to try to serve. And we have to be gentle with it. Right? When we start calling people names and we start saying, well, you know, you're going to go to hell for all eternity. And we come across with this holier than thou. That's not holiness in God's word. But notice what he says after that. He said, we're using those saints, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to knowledge of truth. It doesn't say you. They may not have listened to you at all at the time, at least it seemed, but then 10 years down the road, they're like, you know, I've been thinking for the past 10 years what you told me. I want you to know I've been baptized. That's fantastic. Because God will work on our hearts continuously if we allow him to. He says, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. The only way they can escape the devil and serving him is by allowing the bait of God to hook them into their heart. And God will worry about converting them. We have to do our job. We have to teach them out of kindness, patience, and gentleness. One of the things that people don't like is that they become shamed or embarrassed or upset when they're confronting with their sin. And that's what God's word will do. Right? The scripture tells us it will prick our hearts when we know that we've done wrong and we become aware of what sin is. Right? But what it shouldn't do is cause strife. It shouldn't cause division amongst the church. Right? It shouldn't cause separations of families. In 2 Thessalonians 3, starting in 14, it says, If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person person so as not to associate with him so that he will be put to shame and yet do not regard that person as an enemy all right it says don't allow them to come in and worship with you if they're living in sin and they don't want to acknowledge it all right but we need to abon- admonish not abonish, admonish them as a brother or sister and what that means is, is we need to let them know This choice that you're making or these choices that you're making, they're wrong and they're against God and God doesn't want you doing it. Right. So we need you to correct your life before you come back to worship with us. Notice what he says in 16 there. He says, now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. In every situation that you have to handle in this way and confront the sins of a brother or sister, let the Lord of peace be in control. If we can be at peace, we'll avoid the strife. And we'll be able to show the love and compassion that Jesus has asked us to do. When we live in a world such as we do, where things are trying to be shoved down our throats and Christians are you know, being persecuted, out in the social media and everything else, we still have to remember that God's word is the good and it is the bait to the world. And it may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, it may not be this decade where they become aware, but at some point they will become aware. In Romans 12, 19 through 21, he writes, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, you're to feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil. And if you've had what we refer to as a mortal enemy, you know just how difficult that is. If someone has wronged you, wronged your family, gone against you, 
He even spoke out against God, but then they come to their senses, and you know what? Jesus is my Savior. He wants to forgive me. I'm going to be baptized for remission of my sins, and I'm going to dedicate my life to him. If we try to overcome that individual with evil, we haven't done what God has asked. He simply says that we are to overcome evil with good. Give them something to drink. Give them something to eat. Give them a place to lay their head. Give them love and compassion and patience. Because that's what the bait is. That's how God's love can be hooked into their heart. Always trust the idea that God's word, the bait, is the power that can overcome all scenarios. In Hebrews 4, we're told, he says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. We know this scripture. I think from the time that I was 12 and started attending Gadsden in the old building, we've used this scripture. And I think sometimes we get to a point where we just kind of forget it. And we want to start using our own words and trying to convict people's heart by using our own words. But we have to understand that's not our sword. Our words are not our sword. God's word are our sword. That's what's going to break through the hardness of someone's heart. In Ephesians 6, 17, when we're told that we need to prepare for battle, our last couple of things he talks about having is our hamlet of salvation. We have to keep in mind that no matter what we're addressing, what what we're dealing with, or whatever's coming against us in this world, our salvation has to be on our mind. Because if we allow ourselves to sin, the next breath that we have might be our last. And then where's our soul? We have to handle all of that correctly. Keep it in mind our salvation and then the salvation of others. And it's the word of God that's going to get us through those battles. Going back to our scripture reading, when we look at the things of which Satan has done, right? Satan is constantly trying to beat down Jesus. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes are constantly trying to beat down Jesus. And Jesus doesn't rely on any of his own words. He combats Satan directly with God's word. He uses God's bait to keep himself strong. When he's hungry because he's been fasting, he quotes scripture. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. When Satan tries to quote scripture to Jesus and tells him he's going to have all of this power, he comes back to him and says, It's also written, though, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then when he tries to tempt him with physical wealth and recognition amongst the world, he's like, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He used the bait as his sword to defeat Satan. You and I, We have the perfect bait to defeat this world. And there are times I know, trust me, I know, that in this world we feel like we're constantly under a microscope, we're in battle, and the world wants to defeat us. And they do, because they belong to Satan. But in Matthew 4, 18 through 20, it says, Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, or fishers of people. Jesus wants us to be fishing. He wants us to take the bait with us and go out and fish every day, striving to be an example to the world around us. Not just Christians, because if it's just Christians, we can't save another soul. But in so doing, if we choose to immediately leave our nets, if we choose to go out onto that path, We have to make sure that we don't fall into the trap. We can't take the bait of the world. We can't let it drag us down with it and cause us to sin. Instead, we must stand strong with the bait, the word of God. We must show God's love. We must show who God's son is, that he is the Christ that was promised to all the people all the way back in time. And that he has a salvation for each and every one of us. And that salvation comes from hearing God's word, from believing it, from confessing that 
Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He was there from the beginning and will be there until the end. We repent of our sins. We ask for forgiveness. We get baptized into a watery grave to wash our sins away. But then we continue to go forward from that moment forward. We continue to fish. We continue to teach out of love and patience and kindness. If you have not been baptized, we offer you an opportunity now. Or if you have messed up, if you've taken the bait of the world and you need to bring that forth to the congregation, we give an invitation at this time. Won't you come forward as we stand and sing?